So I'm George Washington University, and thank you, Ron, for saying George Washington, because for one reason or another, sometimes I get introduced from Georgetown University. People mix up Georgetown and George Washington all the time. So let me tell you how, and if there are people here from Georgetown, please forgive me. Let me tell you how to differentiate between the two. Georgetown is named after the occupier of this country, King George. <laughs> GW is named after the liberator of this country, George Washington. <laughs> now, interesting enough, George Washington has his name on many higher education uh, organizations. However, George Washington is the one that he actually left money in his will to build. So actually, George Washington was built and was chartered by Congress in 1821 22 years after he died, based on money he left in his will um, in form of stocks. All right, so uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, verification of subspecialty programs in surgery. So, well, maybe this is better. Is better? Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, as you know from this, the Institute of Medicine put out two reports, one in 2001, 2001. Uh, the first one to err is human, where they described uh, over 100,000, about 100,000 people dying annually in hospitals in the United States because of medical errors. Now, obviously, that mushroomed, but that what started uh, this particular um, uh, uh, discussion. And then 2001, they came up uh, with a, another uh, report crossing uh, the quality chasm where they said you should align incentives of reimbursement accountability with improvement of quality target. And, and again in 2006, and they said we're not moving fast enough, we should move even faster on this one. And then they came up with characteristics of quality care, which should be safe, effective, patient-centered, uh, timely, efficient, equitable. And that was picked up by the lay press, and they started publishing articles like this one, how to make surgery safer. And suddenly, surgeons were started to be almost assaulted by an avalanche of uh, negative uh, press. So that would lead us to the ACA, the Accountability Act of 2010, where a lot of people think about it actually as an insurance reform. But actually, it's insurance reform plus payment reform plus delivery system redesign. But don't let them kid you. Basically, the idea is to reduce cost and increase efficiency so we can pay for access for obviously the million of people uh, that are not currently, uh, at least they were not currently getting care. The interesting thing about this law, it was passed along party line. There was not a single Republican voted for this law. So now uh, when the Republican wants to repeal the law, uh, this, is, this is something that it goes back to when the law was enacted. Now, for the young folks here, residents, and uh, uh, young faculty who did not live under the SGR, which is the sustainable growth rate, I want to say a couple of words about that because it has a huge implication to what's ha happening now. So the way we get paid is our, by CPT codes. And each CPT code is defined by number of units, which are work RVUs, relative value unit, practice RVUs, and malpractice RVUs. So work RVUs is the amount of work we put in and the intensity of the work. Uh, so that's how the RVUs for work are calculated. But then there's a practice RVU. So if you're a medical person, um, they, they estimate every time you see a patient how, how much money you spend. So believe it or not, I sat um, on the RUC, which is a committee that evaluate and value the work. Um, they actually looked how many feet of that white paper that you roll on a table in between patients. And they actually they coasted out of 0.5 cents of 
0.7 cents or something like that. So this is how they come up uh, with the practice RVU. Malpractice RVU, how much uh, we pay for malpractice. Every single one of these is multiplied by a geographic factor because you practice in different areas, then uh, the, the, the practice is costs you, I mean, uh, the, the area, depending what are you practicing here, Palo Alto or New York or um, Walla Walla, Washington, uh, is different costs for practice. So the way they value the CPT code is you take all these RVUs multiplied by their geographic adjustment factor. And these are the total RVUs. And the government multiplied by CF, the conversion factor. I've always called the conversion factor an instrument of the devil. Because you've, we, have, we have about seven, 8,000 CPT codes. The government ratchet up the budget and down based on one number, which is the conversion factor. So it doesn't matter. The RVUs are there. They are valued and re-edited and revalued every five years. But the conversion factor changes every year. And in 1997, uh, with the sustainable growth rate, the, the government decided to use the conversion factor to be adjusted based on the expenditure of the year before. So if the government spends too much money compared to the budget in one year, next year the conversion factor will go down. If they spend less money, then it will go up. So what happened with the conversion factor, and I gave you here a little bit of an example of how, uh, of how it is, is that if you look here and you see 1996, 1997 here, 1998 when it was enacted, the reimbursement dropped by 10% in one year, okay? And that was the effect of the conversion factor. And it kept on dropping, but what happened is there was an uproar in medicine and physicians said, this is not sustainable. So they started doing what's called a doc fix. So every year they come up with the conversion factor. The doctors will go up in arm. There's a lot of lobbying on Congress and Congress will change the conversion factor. So if you look here in 2003, it was minus 4.4% and the doc fix added instead 1.6%. And then here in 2004, it was minus 1.2, they added 37.34. So in this 10 year period, instead of the conversion factor dropping 16.3%, it dropped only 7.6% because of the, what's called the doc fix. Just to give you an example, the conversion factor in 2019 this year is 36.05, and as you see, is still lower than what it was even in 1998. So we are the only industry where with inflation, all that stuff, instead of the prices going up, the prices go down. So because of the dot fix, fix day, year after year after year, and because of all the uh, organization, including American College of Surgeon lobbying Congress, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, repeal the Medicare, Medicare Provider Payment Modernization Act repealed the SGR in 2014. But, but, every time you deal with the government, there's nothing you're gonna get for free. So when they repealed the SGR, then they started with the new system, which is a Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, where you hear about it now and we get a little bit extra money here and there if we do this thing, the other thing. However, all that is gonna change to advanced payment model, APMs, very soon in 2020, 2023. And that actually is a pretty complex uh, model, which probably is gonna have different penetration in the country as a start because Places like California, for example, Massachusetts, already penetrations of uh, bundled payments are in. You look at Washington, D.C., where I practice, because of the government, um, we still fee for service. The majority, majority, almost 100%, we still fee for service. So the, the penetration of these things is going to be a little bit different. Now, if you, this, the, 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 the different thing about this act is was passed by par, bipartisan vote, and it's not only uh, by an, along party line. 
So a lot of people think that this act about MIPS and APM is going to change. It's not going to change. It's a different law, bipartisan vote. So if there's a repeal of the ACA, there will be a repeal of this ACA, but this is going to be with us. And that's the important part about this whole thing. So what this is doing now is moving from payment for pay for service, which fee for service, as I said, uh, purely fee for service, and then augmented fee for service, which used to be called pay for performance, into payment for event or condition. That's a bundled payment for certain event, and it's moving towards payment care of a population, which is partial capitation to full capitation. But the fundamental issue of all that stuff, the fundamental issue, is that the payment is moving from volume from FIFA service where you do more stuff, you get more money into value. And the issue now is who is going to define value for us as subspecialties, okay? And if we don't define it, trust me, there's a lot of people who would love to do it out there. You've got governmental agencies, insurance companies, corporations, patient advocacy groups, interest groups. They're happy to do it for us. So. We need to engage and define quality and value for our subspecialties. And when I say we, I mean we, the surgeons, represented by our surgical societies and organization that are representing the, our subspecialties. So such organization, they need to define quality of surgical care and it's becoming more and more urgent to do so. So what I'm going to do is use the example of vascular surgery, but there are many other subspecialties doing that. Uh, GI, they're putting together now complex GI program. Uh, they decided, see, every subspecialty decides to do it differently. In vascular surgery, we decided to do the whole thing. In GI, they decided to do complex GI. So they're doing pancreas, liver, and esophagus. Uh, putting together verification programs for that. So the issue is, uh, how about then to talk a little bit about vascular surgery, how we put it together. Now, all of our subspecialty have been talking about these things for a year. I remember in uh, 25 years ago, a group of us uh, from Society for Vascular Surgery met in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. in order to come up with what we called at the time vascular center certification program. We didn't do it. We didn't do it because it was costly. There was no impetus actually to do it other than we wanted to do it. Uh, and then at the time we had issues, who's going to administer the program? We talked with the Joint Commission. We talked with IAC, which is the Inter-Societal Accreditation Commission. Um, and then where the program is going to be housed? These programs are pretty expensive. And working with other subspecialties proved to be extremely difficult difficult. So then we started, uh, and then I became regent uh, of the college, the vascular regent, uh, about four years ago. And you go to the college and you, you get like immersed into the quality issues. The college did a superb job to move the discussion from reimbursement to quality because this is really what gives us uh, uh, the leverage to do stuff. People don't want to listen to a bunch of folks driving the best cars, living in the best areas, and making what they think uh, is a pretty huge amount. So there was the Washington Post, since I live in Washington, did a survey, and they say, the survey say, how much do you think your doctor make? And the average was $75,000. The next question, do you think your doctor make too much money? My doctor is making so much money, it should be cut in half. All right? So. That's a survey of the population. So people are not going to listen to us if we talk. We want reimbursement, more money, and all that kind of stuff. So the quality was very smart. They picked up this pretty early and started moving the discussion into quality care. And the government, governmental agency, actually listens quite a bit to the college. So we thought, well, I started being a, in the college and looking at all that stuff, got back to uh, the leadership of the SBS, and I said, folks, we need to come up with this program that we approached 25 years before, but we didn't do it, but it's extremely important now. And to give them credit, 
the leadership, Ron and others, uh, said, you know what, this is something we ought to do, all right? So I was asked to lead the effort. So the college has multiple programs already enacted. Obviously, the cancer program started in the 1920s, 1930s. So many, many years they have that. It's completely different now where it used to be, but it started a long time ago. And then uh, trauma centers and all that stuff. So what happened is recently the SVS and the American College of Surgeon cut together and say, let's, let's work together on a vascular verification program. Why? The college can offer the infrastructure. They have a huge infrastructure, about 100 people in that department that work on these things. Uh, and that will defray some of the cost that we will incur. Also, they can help in putting the program in operation if the SVS chooses to, uh, to do so. SVS can offer the knowledge, the political will to improve quality of vascular care, the long-term commitment to vascular surgery, its members and patients, and most importantly, we have VQI. Now, what also prompted uh, the society to do that is the OBL. OBL are the office-based labs. They are proliferating everywhere. Yesterday, John and I were talking about this. The stuff that's being done in those labs are, I mean, so ridiculous that I don't think any one of us can support. Um, uh, they're doing people who are asymptomatic. There's no control. There's no m and There are no hospital committees to check. Uh, and they get paid an arm and a leg. To give you an example, a balloon angioathorectomy of superficial femoral artery and, and a stent, uh, we get paid an average of $870 if you do it in the hostel as the surgeon who is doing it. In the office-based lab, you get paid $15,500, $542 actually. So they're getting paid an arm and a leg, and it's controlling uh, the practice. So I talked with some surgeons in our national meeting, we'll be going in the exhibit area. They would be, they talk about using, for example, an expensive stent, and they say, I only use it in the hospital. If I use it in my OBL, it's gonna cost me money. So the practice of vascular surgery is changing now because of that. So it's actually, it's a, and the government did it because they want to save money and then the last uh, calculation that actually is costing more money because the volume skyrocketed. All right, so the college put these programs uh, based on uh, a structure and the structure has four underpinnings. Uh, you set the standards, you build the right infrastructure, you use the right data collection for the college is NISQIP. For our program, we're gonna use our uh, registry, VQI, Vascular Quality Initiative, which we already have and functioning. And then you verify with outside experts. So think about your trauma verification program, think about uh, your uh, bariatric surgery verification program. Uh, that's basically what it is. So here are the four standards. Uh, Standards here, backed by research, but you have to individualize them by patient. Uh, right infrastructure on staffing, specialist, equipment, checklist, rigorous data collection, which is res registry and medical chart, and then external review will come for a day or day and a half, review the program, and the program is verified. So the trauma verification program has been extremely successful, as we know and uh, it's been going on now since 1976. There's some six iteration, and now uh, they're going through the seventh, and I'm sure uh, David Spain will know much more about this than I do, but this is a program that has been uh, doing extremely uh, well for uh, the college and the trauma program. It is a three-level program, and basically uh, every level has a certain set of infrastructure that you have to follow. It's multidisciplinary, which actually a vascular program would be the same. Also, you have nurses involvement and other staff members. And for that, they had to come up with their own uh, registry, which is TQIP, the Trauma Quality Improvement Program, which is a variation of NISQIP. As I said, we have VQI and vascular, and, 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 and the college agreed with us to use it. But uh, also the trauma, in addition to being uh, verified and organized 
which provide leverage uh, in the institution for the trauma program leader uh, is that um, uh, over, a, uh, over the years decreased mortality by 8 to 10 percent. Now there are other programs for the college, as you see, this is the Commission on Cancer, the Bariatric, and the Trauma, and they just enacted, uh, put together and put it out a program for pediatric surgery, which received actually a lot of uh, 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 articles in the lay public. So these are the current programs in red that the college has, and these are the current program in white that the college is working on. So there's a lot of activity going on in the college, and the decision now is to do these with specialty societies. So we're doing the vascular program with them, uh, complex GI, uh, Fabrizio Michelazzi, actually from New York, he is the one leading that effort as I'm leading the vascular. So uh, you, there's a book that comes out, All it's now electronic, again for the trauma is level-based structure, has been existent for many years, proved to improve quality, however it's more emergent care model, so it doesn't apply uh, directly to vascular surgery, which is uh, most of the time is elective. Now the bariatric uh, program actually is, is elective, uh, it's purely surgical model, um, there's no emergency in it, uh, very elective, uh, limited number of procedures to master, only four or five, and now most of them they are doing one actually. There's also redo surgery, but uh, it's pretty limited, not, not like vascular, but also proven to improve quality. The most important thing about the bariatric program that initially Medicare and other insurance said we would pay if you have, if you were verified by the American College of Surgeons. That requirement was dropped. Interestingly enough, hospitals are still going for verification. So it, once you get used to it, I guess you don't want to let it go. So despite the fact in the beginning they had to do it because of governmental requirement, now uh, they're doing it even without that. Now what also the college put together very recently is the Red Book. And the red book is the optimal resources for surgical quality and safety. And the reason I'm telling you about this book, because at the end you will see it's going to actually have a, uh, an importance uh, in what we're doing. So basically, just to summarize what the red book said, that surgical care should be team-based care. The surgeon as a leader in each phase of surgical care. Uh, it also says surgical quality officer. This is new that hospitals should have surgical quality officers to look at all perioperative care and define four phases of, uh, sorry, define five phases of surgical care. And they are preoperative evaluation and preparation, immediate preoperative, intraoperative uh, care, postoperative, and post-discharge care. So everything is divided along these five phases of care. And again, as I said, it also calls for a surgical quality officer to interact with the chair of surgery, hospital CMO, or system CMO in uh, big systems. All right, so when we started thinking about uh, the vascular program, uh, the issue is how to put it together. As I told you, trauma, I also showed you Bariatric, they have only four case, four different cases in it, but for vascular, it's much more complex. So we could have divided it in, based on the complexity of the procedure performed. Uh, arterial versus venous, inpatient versus outpatient, vascular surgery versus endovascular surgery. Focus area, how about an aortic program? I mean, you guys here have an unbelievable aortic program academically, clinically, and otherwise. So you may decide, I want to just have an aortic program. And that was actually pushed a little bit by a cardiac surgeon who did vascular surgery because they love to do aortic stuff. Um, or limb salvage program, or how about cerebrovascular program, or combination of the above. So it, it took us really a, a few months to figure out how to put it together. Uh, so at the end, we thought, Probably the best way uh, to do it is to do a multi-level uh, multi -level or modular program that would be based on complexity. That's what we originally thought. So 
So he, this is how we came up with it. Now this is still being refined, so don't read the exact procedures and all that stuff. Uh, it'll be refined. But the idea is we have different level of complexity. We have highest level of complexity, which could be aortic arch, proximal branches, descending thoracoabdominal aneurysms, uh, visceral aorta and east branches. And that could be hospital based, all right? Uh, that could be done open uh, or endo in the hospital. And then you have the moderate complexity. Uh, also down here, which include all the procedure we do out there. And then we have that moderate but only outpatient, which is a little bit different, it's still being refined. My idea originally is to have three level, high complexity, moderate complexity, and then uh, uh, lowest complexity. And then when we had the meetings, people said that's too many levels and all that stuff. But so we, we stuck with highest and moderate, but it looks to me now that people are not liking this because they're saying, well, AV access, a vein, that should not be the moderate complexity. So very possibly we will move to a third level, which is the lowest complexity. But the idea is <clears throat> there will be the, the, the program that's approved for the highest complexity can do all the complexity below that. And if you, someone wants to uh, come up with an aortic program, you look where the aortic procedures are done and you be, have to be approved for that instead of being approved just for aortic program. Now, <clears throat> and this is basically the important part. Again, don't read, I just wanna give you an idea of what we're doing. This is the infrastructure that's gonna be required for each level and it's color coded. So the, high, the highest complexity as you see here in, in yellow, and this is the medium complexity or moderate, and this is the outpatient, and each one of them uh, has, I mean, it, and this rolls down like 60 lines and tells you what has most of the stuff we already have, so it's not new, but to be sure that we have them. And the most important thing is that for the outpatient, we're not sure whether these people are having the appropriate equipment actually to do what they're doing. So that becomes extremely important for our patient. Now how about some function, functions that usually are existing, non-invasive vascular laboratory, wound and limb salvage centers, freestanding veins, freestanding AV access centers. What we decided is the following. Take an example of the lab. If uh, the lab, if there is already a certification process by uh, IAC for the labs, or what we say for the lab, check. Your lab is certified, you check, you're done. So we're not gonna reinvent the wheel in these programs. Originally, this is the complex structure that we put together to do the work. And this little bit about the process to tell you, we've already, the committee met face to face six times already. We usually meet at the Chicago O'Hare Airport because we meet with the college people, uh, headquarters in Chicago. So the first meeting, we put together a grid for every procedure, what we need, like I showed you, human resources, space, equipment, and other services. And that's the grid as I showed you. And then based on this grid, we, uh, we're putting the standards. Right? And this is a continuous process that we're almost done with it. Originally, we came up with 93 standards, which we merged and revised into 44 standards, which we just had a meeting recently, and we revised those down to 32 standards that we can use. We have organized the standards into nine areas that represent various components of the episode of care, and here they are. CEO commitment, program governance and scope, facilities required, services and personnel, patient care, data, quality improvement, research and clinical trials, and education and community outreach. Nine episodes of care that all programs now are gonna be organized based on that. So this is our VASCO program. These are our standard CEO commitment. There's only one standard there. A letter comes from the CEO committing the facility to support that program. Number two, a program governance scope, also one standard. But when you go to facilities, there will be multiple standards. So the number of standards in each area is basically different. And then we are, Redefining all these standards, putting some granularity, for example, 
example, in the CEO letter, what should be included in the CEO letter. So when the organization send that letter, they know exactly what needs to be included. And then we put together for the OBL, because a special case that we're all concerned about, we put together the infrastructure requirement per complexity level and OBL. And uh, there's the OBL committee that we have within our infrastructure. Actually, I sent them these five items, and they responded to all these five items. What are the requirements in each one of these? Now we are at the stage where we have the standards all, almost done. We're looking for six to 10 programs to do beta testing, which would be the first program. And we're going to go there and do a site visit. Which we're going to do that in the summer between July and August, hopefully. And we're going to go beta test and learn from these programs as we are verifying these programs so we can readjust the standards to be more user friendly. Because we don't want this process. I mean, we're vascular surgeons. We don't want to make it difficult for vascular surgeons. So after we put everything together, now we change the organizational structure to the vascular standards committee, only one that's going to be uh, responsible for implementing uh, the program. Now, uh, as I said before, we're going to use the Vascular Quality Initiative. It's our registry in Save of NISQIP, and that was agreed upon by the college. Now, the issue is when we talk about the OBL and the indication, that's a hugely important issue. There's going to be an indication component to each area. So you're going to say, well, give us the size of the last 100 annuals we have done. Um, how many were 3.5 centimeters, which people do? four centimeters, which people do. So it's going to be an indication. And those are based on the guidelines that were issued, uh, have been issued by uh, the Society for Vascular Surgery. But we're going to be extremely careful. In the beginning, it's going to be what you should be doing, not what you must do. And little by little by little, when people buy in and people get used to it, then we start being a little bit more hard-nosed about it. Now, uh, all these standards, as I said, and the indication taken from clinical practice guidelines that were put together by Society for Vascular Surgery. Uh, this is one uh, with uh, uh, a lower extremity vascular disease that I participated on. This is one for abdominal aortic uh, uh, aneurysm that was put by the society. Now, how to put the program in operation? Uh, the, you have to decide. Society for Vascular Surgery is going to run it. It looks like we made the decision that we're going to partner with the ACS to do it. They do have the infrastructure to do it, so uh, we probably it's going to be housed in the American College of Surgeons, but the SVS will have a partnership with the college in how to run it and financial aspect and otherwise. Now, the problem is in what we do there are a lot of other subspecialty that would do it. You got the cardiologist, you got the radiologist, and they're the ones opening a lot of OBLs out there. So we actually approach the American College of Cardiology, Society for Interventional Radiology, Society for Vascular Medicine and Vascular Nursing, and we were at the beginning very skeptical. So we decided not to ask them from the very beginning. We decided to put together a close to finish program and then invite them because there will be huge argument about everything. And that was derived from when I put together practice guideline for the society, I decided to involve these subspecialties. Instead of a year and a half, it took me three years. I spent a year and a half to try to convince them about stuff that there's no way they're going to be convinced about. So the decision we made this time is let's wait until we have some program, and then we invite them. So we did. And actually, it worked very, very well. So now ACC sent representative SIR, SVM, SVN. They sent them. Now we're approaching other societies. Now, a lot of people say, why are you doing this? It should be a vascular surgery program. We can't have a program that only vascular surgeons are going to use. Everyone who are, who's doing that particular, those particular procedures should be involved in those programs. So the overarching principle of this, and it uh, took me a while to come up with this, and uh, let me just go. So this is a program under the auspices of the SVS and ACS to drive quality and value by helping the clinical team leader to leverage the infrastructure necessary in the institution, whether inpatient or outpatient, to perform 
various vascular procedures in an environment that is safe, unconducive to excellent patient outcomes and experience. And that's going to be basically the overarching uh, principle for the program. We'll probably refine it a little bit, but that's what's going to be. Now, I mentioned there the clinical team leader. And the clinical team leader is essential, right? And every hospital is different. Every institution is different. So we decided that the specialty of the clinical team leader would be site-specific. So in some programs where they have a vascular medicine person who's got the time, willing to do it, and has the skill to do it, then it could be the vascular medicine cut. But that has to be from especially represented in one of the specialties in the multidisciplinary team. And that person should possess certain characteristics that position the program for success. So, uh, that person should have experience in leading safe, high-performance team. His or her practice should be evidence-based. Outcomes data should be extremely important to that person and ready and able and has the personality to do public reporting. Professional development should be continuous and communication respect for others. It's not a dictatorship. So basically, we're re redefining professionalism in this. Instead of autonomy, collaboration. Instead of authority, evidence. Instead of assertion, measurement. Instead of control, transparency. And instead of self-interest, public interest. And therefore, professionalism will equal accountability. And we feel that is extremely important. Now. And this is what just happened recently. Actually, we had the first meeting last Wednesday in New York. The college start, started to grow more and more concerned about the number of the quality program and the complaints from different uh, institutions that it's becoming so costly. I mean, how many programs are we going to pay for? The vascular, the trauma, the bariatric, the cancer. It's too much. So David Hoy, the executive director of the college, heard it and put together a very small group, seven people, and asked me to be on it. And basically this group is charged, is charged to, to think about the future of the college quality program. How are we gonna put it in such a way that it's gonna be more efficient than what we have now? As I said, we had the first meeting in New York last Wednesday, and one of the idea is, if we, if all these become under one umbrella, and the base for it would be the red book, and this is why I wanted to talk to you about the red book earlier. The base is the red book. And then the hospital will have multiple program. The vast majority of the stuff that's in the red book is actually already exists in these programs. So the red book will be the base, and then the college will come and spend three, four days and look Verify whether the red book is used appropriately. And then if you have trauma, bariatric, and cancer, those will be reviewed in a day. And uh, if you have vascular when we have it, thoracic, complex GI, those will be reviewed in about a day. And the cost will drop dramatically. And there will be much, much, much less uh, impact on the institution that has to continuously prepare from one program to another. So this is one idea that we already kind of thinking about. Now, the one area in value that I didn't mention, which is extremely important, and recently we started working about it. So on Thursday in the Washington office of the college, we had a meeting about this and that how do you put cost in the middle of everything. Because when you talk about value, that's quality and cost. So there's this book, which is actually an extremely interesting book, so Redefining Healthcare, written by uh, Michael Porter. And basically, he talks about integrated practice units, IPUs. And basically, if you look here, you organize care into integrated practice units, IPUs. You measure the outcomes and you measure cost. You move to bundled payment for care cycles. And like that, you have the outcome and cost. And then you integrate the care delivery across facility. And then you expand the excellent services across geography. 
All right, so he's thinking 20, 30 years from now, we are concerned at the college that this is something is actually going to come because these are the people that advise the government. We're not the people advising the government. So the government listen to that kind of talk. So the idea I showed you here, the guiding principles of continuous quality improvement, four of them, and the idea is on that we should overlay also patient satisfaction. That's becoming now extremely important. And on top of that, overlay the cost. So instead of these four underpinnings, you end up with six underpinnings. And cost is becoming extremely important to demonstrate value, and it's important to hospitals and payers. So in conclusion, payment for physician services is moving from fee-for-service to payment for value, quality and efficiency, and we need as physicians and surgeons to define value. We should not leave it to others. Reforms need the realistic input, which is best gotten from experts in the field, and we are the expert, not the bureaucrats sitting in Washington. So we need to be involved and participate in the process. We can do that as surgical specialties by establishing our own surgical quality programs and verification processes that would lead to improved quality and value. The same thing that happened with trauma and happened with bariatric when the government said, we're going to use the trauma program uh, for your certification. We're going to use bariatric after they drop that before they drop that requirement. And this is our opportunity to lead the process in providing high quality and efficient care for our patients and gain the governmental and public trust. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you.